Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. Today's message is entitled, God's Promises. God's promises are shown throughout His Word, throughout the Scriptures. They're real promises, true promises, promises that you can depend on. That's what we're going to discuss today. God's sincere promises, promises to all of us, each and every one of us can go through the scriptures and claim those promises. Turn with me please to Joshua chapter 21 verse 45. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. In this verse, which is only one sentence long, the word all is used twice. All the good promises, all came to pass. Now this word all means everything, the entirety. It means the totality of everything, the whole shebang. There was nothing that was left out, nothing that was left undone. Every single one of God's promises, every single one of God's good promises were fulfilled for Israel. God had done what it was he said that he was going to do. Now some folks will ask, why good promises? Well, they'll ask, well, why not just promises? Aren't all of God's promises good? Well, those are really good questions. The reason that the word good was thrown in there is to describe what kind of promises that were fulfilled. But why they would persist? The, the answer is this, because God made two types of promises. One, good promises, and two, not so good promises. The kind that gets confused with threats. Promises like if you serve other gods, you will be punished. As in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 17 through 18. It says, But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. Those are, are not threats. That is not a threat. That is a promise. I promise you that if you do that, this will happen. And if you do this, that will happen. It is, it is not a threat. You see, a threat is defined as an expression of intent to hurt, destroy, punish, etc. as in retaliation or intimidation. God is not retaliating, neither is he trying to intimidate. He is explaining the way that things work. There are rewards for what you do, and there are consequences for what you do. It's plain and simple. You do, you do good, your reward is good. You do bad, your reward is bad. That's not a threat. That, my friends, is a promise. I promise you this, if you do this, this will happen. So all the good promises of God were all fulfilled for Israel and not one of them failed. God's promises are the same for us. The good will be fulfilled with the bad and not one of them will fail. Here's what God said in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God operates in a reward and consequence type system. You are rewarded for what you do and every decision that you make has consequences. 
If you read your Bible, you will find that there are many, many good promises in it. Select the promise that fits your situation and pray the Word of God over that situation. The Word of God will not fail. But some women ask, how do I know or how can I believe that I can ask or pray God's Word and He will do it for me. He will hear me and He will do it for me. Well, John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14 says, Whatever you ask in my name, and this is Jesus speaking, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's Jesus himself that's making that promise. He, he says that if you ask anything in his name, he will do it for us. All we have to do is to ask because he cannot deny his own words. Neither can he neglect the promises that, his, that, that he made. That's his promise to us. He will hear us and he will answer. Not only once, but several times he reiterated the promise, showing that it was not a slip of the tongue or a mistake in speaking. It was and is his solemn promise to anyone who will receive it. Now listen to what Jesus says two chapters later. John chapter 16, verse 23 through 24. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus explains to his disciples that in that day. What day was Jesus referring to? The days after his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, after he had been glorified and ascended to heaven. They would have access straight to the Father. And again, just, just like Adam and Eve had in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. They would not have to go through a high priest because at his death, the veil in the temple was torn in two. Turn to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 through 51. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. At Jesus' death, the incident of his death, the first thing that happened was that the temple, that the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two. Previously, only the high priest was allowed to pass through the curtain and go into the most holy place, and that only once a year. But on Jesus' death, through his death, gave us access to the Father, gave us access to the most holy place. Notice that the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Josephus tells us that the curtain was approximately 60 feet tall and four inches wide. So it could not possibly be torn by an ordinary man. It had to be the hand of God. Why? For one, it was way too tall. It was 60 feet tall. And it was much, much too thick. It was like four inches thick. Therefore, it would stand to reason that it would have to be God himself who reached down and torn the veil, signifying man's entrance now into the Holy of Holies, where the mercy seat of God was and the presence of God dwelled. So Jesus, knowing this, said with confidence in John chapter 16, verse 23 through 24, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Ordinary men were not allowed to go straight to the Father and ask for anything because they were not allowed into the intimate place with the Father. 
They had to go through the high priest. They had to go through a man. But after Jesus' death, the veil was torn. And now we have access to the Father and can ask him himself, ask the Father himself in Jesus' name for anything we desire. And he will give it to us. The key is ask it in the name of Jesus. We no longer need a man. We no longer need that high priest as, as a go-between because Jesus himself is our high priest and he is our link between God the Father and us. So we, with unveiled faces, can boldly approach with confidence the throne of grace and ask whatever we desire. This is a promise so bold that you would have to have inside information or great power in order to make the promise in the first place and then to keep it after that. And we know that Jesus had both. Jesus had inside information and he also had great power. So the promise is valid and it's yours and it's mine. And we need to believe and stand on that promise that God hears us when we pray. And if he hears us, he will answer. Why? Because Jesus died to be able to make us that promise and to keep that promise. It's through his death and resurrection that we have that promise in the first place. So if he was to die for something, why would he withhold it from us? The answer is he would not. John chapter 16, verse 24 says, says ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus slash God slash the Father are interested in our state of mind. Jesus is interested in our welfare and in our joy. He wants to give us peace. He wants to give us joy and he wants to give it to us in its fullness. Many people feel unhappy. They feel unloved. Neither, they, they feel loved neither from man or from God. They feel like nobody loves them. They're all alone in the world with no one to care about them. Well, I'm here today to tell you that that is a lie. Early on in the gospel, the gospel that we just read, the gospel according to John, Jesus says, John chapter 3, verse 16, better known as John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life this promise that God loves you dearly is backed up with action the death of Jesus by crucifixion on a Roman cross is proof that Jesus that God, that the Father loves you more than you will ever begin to know or to realize or to understand. His love for you is immeasurable. Take that promise in times when the devil comes against you to torment your mind, that no one loves you, that no one cares about you. No, encourage yourself in the Lord, that Jesus loves you, that God loves you, the God of all creation and the supreme ruler of the whole universe loves you and died for you to prove his love, to purchase you from death to life. All you have to do is believe. You can rest on that promise rest secure on that promise. He will forgive you. He will wash you clean. He will comfort and give you peace. He will watch over you and he will keep you safe. There's nothing that your God will not do for you because you are his and you can claim him as yours. Jeremiah 29 11 through 14 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes. Yes, I understand this promise was made specifically to the Jews. But rest assured, God has plans for you. The, he, the, the very same kind of plans that he had for his people, the Jewish people, he has those same plans for you. There are good, good plans. There are plans of blessings, plans of hopes, plans for a good and prosperous future for you, for your children, for your family. There are good plans, plans designed just for you. God promises to hear us, not just the Jews. Jesus did not die just for one nation or for one people, but John 3.16 tells us that he loved the whole world so much that he died for the whole world. So when we pray, God will hear. When we call, he will answer. When we seek him or search for him, he will be found by us. But you must seek with all of your heart, not just a half-heartedly uh, attempt. You have to seek him with all your heart. And when you do that, he will be found by you because he will let himself be found by you. Then he will restore to you all that the enemy has stolen from you. Whatever it is he stole. Did he steal your children? Did he steal your health? Did he steal your finances? God will restore that to you. But come, seek his face, call upon his name, search for him, and he will let himself be found, and he will restore to you all that the enemy has taken. Those are great and comforting promises. Promises you can take to the bank. Is your mind filled with unrest? Is it filled with torment? Let the Lord Jesus cleanse your mind and dry those tormenting thoughts out of your head and replace them with wholesome thoughts, thoughts of beauty and thoughts of life. God is not just concerned with your soul, though, or with your mind, but with your health and with your wealth. Healing. Look at what, what Isaiah says about healing. This is Isaiah's word from, from the Lord God himself. Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus in Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he, meaning Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And Peter, looking back to the death and resurrection, said, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he, bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Isaiah says, we are, although it hadn't happened yet. Isaiah was prophesying, yet he said, we are. Because God calls those things that are not as if they were. He, God proclaims the end from the beginning. Peter speaking through the Holy Spirit said, we have been because Peter realized and understood that our healing had been bought. It had, been, had come to pass now. That prophecy of Isaiah was now complete in Jesus' death and resurrection. By his stripes, we are healed. It was been paid in full by Jesus. So again, if Jesus paid for something for you, why would he withhold it from you? You have to go and claim your healing. You have to go and claim those promises. God is able to heal whatever disease you may have. And you will be healed because God is a good, good father. Don't say to yourself, I know he can. I know he has healed others. But I don't know if he will do it for me. Claim your healing and add prayer along with the scripture. Add some fasting. 
Because a three-strand cord is not easily broken. God will honor His own word. Search the scriptures and find every promise of healing and stand on those promises and claim them for your own and you will be healed. Don't wait to see the results. Be like the ten lepers who asked Jesus for a healing. And Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priest. And they all turned around and ran off. They began running to show themselves to the priest. Before any evidence of healing had occurred. And while they were on their way, they were healed. They were cleansed of their leprosy. So that is how we have to be. We don't, have, we don't wait to be healed to go to the high priest. As long as Jesus said, you are healed, we claim it. We begin running with that belief. And there are many, many more stories like that in the Bible of healing, divine healing. And people taking Jesus' word. Remember what God said in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. There are those who believe that in order to be a true Christian, a real Christian, you must be poor. Because you can't be rich or well off or even making up a good living and be a true Christian. But that is not the case at all. That is a lie from the pits of the enemy's camp. Jesus only requires you to give away all your earthly possessions if your earthly possession has you. If your earthly possessions possess you and you cannot get free from its hold and you will perish because of them, then Jesus will say, okay, give away all that you have and come and follow me. Here is the reality of things. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. God wants us healthy and wealthy. He wants us prosperous. He wants us to prosper in spiritual things. He wants us to prosper in physical things. And He wants us to prosper in financial things. He does not want us sick and broke. Look at what John the Beloved says in the third, third epistle. 3 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. He said, I wish or I pray above all things, everything else. This is what I pray, that we prosper, that you and I prosper and be in good health, just like our souls prosper because he wants us to be prosperous spiritually physically and financially god does not want us sick and broke i'm telling you he wants us prosperous and in good health he wants us to be good strong christ-like christians that's what he wants he wants us to to to, to get closer and closer to him every single day we, we're not hot one day and cold the next. We are climbing closer and closer to the Lord. Would you like to be a Christ-like Christian? Would you like to be prosperous and in good health? Rest assured that that is not God who wants you sick. It is not God who wants you in poverty, but it's the enemy. Just think about it. Look at this beautiful world that God created and gave to us. Well, it was really, really beautiful until the wickedness of man and his greed began to destroy it. But yet, even all of that into consideration, the world is still a beautiful place. There are beautiful sights, the sunset, the, the waterfalls, the beautiful forests and trees and flowers and the world is still a beautiful place so i'm inviting you to come and serve the lord with gladness bow before his throne with thanksgiving 
Would you like to know his salvation today? Here's how. All you got to do is to pray this prayer. Just a simple prayer. A prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer of repentance. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you gave the gift of life to me. I accept it now. Help me to live for you the rest of my life. Help me to serve you wholeheartedly and to believe and stand in all your promises. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what I want you to do. Buy a Bible. Begin to read your Bible daily. Record or, or, or highlight those promises. Hide them away in your heart. And when, when things go bad, when, when, when something um, is wrong, remember those promises. Stand on those promises. And the Lord is faithful to remember his promises and fulfill them to you if you receive them, if you claim them. Find a Bible-believing church who believes in the power of the Lord, who believes in holy living, who believes that there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. Not one of those progressive churches, but a Bible-believing church. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you believe or what it is that you should be doing. And he'll take you to be with him, that where he is, there you shall be forever and ever. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.